In this video, we will be covering how membranes are transported within the cell. We will go over protein sorting, vesicular transport, secretory, and endocytic pathways. So we will explore how things are shot out of the cell and taken into the cell. All right. So first of all, we have to kind of find the origin of the membrane-bound organelles. So this is everything except mitochondria and chloroplasts. So scientists believe that everything except mitochondria and chloroplasts originated by the invagination of the plasma membrane. So notice that if we focus on these ribosomes on the plasma membrane, evolution occurs and over time, the plasma membrane kind of goes in on itself. So now we're forming these little channels of empty space within the cell. Now, here we have the outline of the plasma membrane. Eventually, the plasma membrane continues to form kind of like an, uh, an outline, and it eventually forms some organelles, right? So now here we have the nucleus, right? And as you can see, the nucleus was just kind of like a free-floating um, free DNA, and eventually the plasma membrane invaginated and it formed a pocket around the DNA. And here we have the nucleopore, the outer membrane, the nucleus, the endoplasmic reticulum, etc. And so what I'm trying to say is that these, these organelles, these pockets formed by the invagination of the plasma membrane. Within the cell, we have three types of membrane enclosed transport. And those three types are going to be color coded. The first type is called gated transport. So this is called gated transport. And it relates to the nucleus. So if you have information going from the cytosol to the nucleus or from the nucleus to the cytosol, the type of transport that it will use is the gated transport. Now, if we're talking about transmembrane transport, we have transmembrane transmembrane transport, so I'm just going to put trans right there, trans P. That is going to be from the mitochondria to the cytosol, chloroplast to the cytosol, peroxisome to the cytosol, endoplasmic reticulum to the cytosol, and back and forth. And then the last type of transport that we have is called vesicular, vesicular -ular transport. And of course, this is the tr type of transport that can take in things from the outside or release it into the external environment. So for instance, uh, insulin, whenever insulin needs to be shot out of the cell, it will transport itself in the little vesicles. And again, vesicles are kind of like the 18-wheelers uh, that transport materials from the cell. So for instance, hormones like um, insulin that will transport itself in the vesicular transport, right? So that is a transport. Now we have to talk about the, um, kind of like the proteins, right? So within cell biology, proteins are constantly being unfolded and folded. Now within the intracellular transport, we have to examine whether these proteins are folded or not folded. Within the gated transport, the proteins, the proteins are folded. That means that a protein is folded when it enters the nucleus, and it's also folded when it leaves the nucleus. What about vesicular transport? For vesicular transport, this is also folded. So the proteins are folded. That means that within the vesicles, the protein would be folded. And then it's going to be um, is going to exit the cell. So here's the cell membrane. So we're going to call this cell membrane. And it will eventually release the protein out into the environment. So you know that we are still coiled. That means that we are still folded. So whenever uh, insulin needs to kind of be released into the environment, it is folded, right? But what about transmembrane transport? Well, for this one, 
there, there, there are cases where the protein is folded, and there are some organelles that have the protein unfolded. And so you can't really say, oh, this is always going to be folded, or oh, this is always going to be unfolded, because there's really a combination. And so this one doesn't really play nicely. It, it doesn't fit well. So we can't say that it's always going to be folded or unfolded. So we can say that this is both, right? So for different organelles, we have different um, statuses for the protein. And here we have the cell. So the cell has like a good example of, of uh, the transporters. So notice that some proteins right here, proteins made in the cytosol, some of them are going to do transmembrane transport. So these blue guys are going to go into the transmembrane transport, right? Some of them are going to do vesicular transport, like the green ones. And then some red ones are, well, they're going to go somewhere else. So it's not really color-coded color for this example, but you can see here. So for instance, these guys right here, that would be going through the gated transport. Since we have uh, proteins going into the nucleus, that's always gated transport. For the chloroplast, that would be transmembrane transport, so we're going to call that TP. And for the vesicles, obviously, that's going to be vesicular transport, so we call that VT. Now, before I leave this slide, I have to talk about um, kind of like this special system. So between the endoplasmic reticulum and the cell exterior, all these systems right here, the endosome, the lysosome, the secretory vesicles, the Golgi apparatus, that is called the endo, that is called the endo, endomembrane system. So anything that wants to get into the cell or anything that wants to leave the cell has to go through the endomembrane system. So for my example with insulin, if I create insulin and I need to release it, the insulin, which we'll call I, will have to go to the Golgi, and then it will have to go to the vesicle, the, the secretary vesicles, and then it has to go to the cell exterior. If I'm taking in insulin, it has to go from the cell exterior inside the endosome, which we will talk about, and then the endosome has to either transport it to the other endosome or to a lysosome because this is kind of like the sorting compartment. And so this endomembrane system, uh, it dictates what can leave and what can enter. Now we have to talk about anterior grade and retrograde. So retrograde, retrograde, we have the retrograde endomembrane system. Now retro means old, right? It means old, but it can also mean reverse. So if I say, if insulin were to undergo a retrograde endomembrane system, what would that mean? So you would say, okay, it would go from the reverse direction. So we're going to go upwards. We go from the cell exterior to the Golgi to the ER, or you can say the cell exterior to the endosome to another endosome, to the Golgi, to the ER. So it is the reverse, you're going upwards. Now if we say anterior grade, so anterior, anterior grade, that means forward. Or at least that's how I remember it. So forward means that we're going to go downwards. This is kind of like the conventional way that hormones and other items leave the cell. So we'd go from the ER to the Golgi to the endosome to the cell exterior. Or you can say the secretory vesicles to the cell exterior. It's just kind of like the natural way that we leave. So this is very important. This is called the endomembrane system and that goes from the ER all the way to the cell exterior. Now the easy way to remember the vesicular transport is essentially everything after the Golgi is vesicular transport. Obviously, vesicles are going to be part of that vesicular transport system, and endosomes, as you'll see later, are obviously part of the vesicular transport system. But the main thing that you have to remember is that the Golgi and the ER are part of the vesicular transport system. Now, the way that these proteins or other items can move through the cell is that they have signal sequences. So a signal, signal, sequence. Right, and so a signal sequence can be three amino acids all the way to 60 amino acids. 
And these amino acids, for instance, we can have threonine, um, alanine, serine, that can actually code for, and I'm just making this up, this can code for ER. So if I have a protein, let's say protein X, and let's call this protein, or I guess signal W, if protein X has signal W attached to it, it will actually go to the endoplasmic reticulum because uh, signal W codes for the endoplasmic reticulum. And so we need these signals to know where we're going. It's kind of like a factory, right? We have a cell and we have drivers, but these drivers don't know where to go. They have the cargo. For instance, they could have insulin, but they don't know where to go. So we need these signals to tell them where in the cell to go. So if I, if I give a driver a piece of paper and it says go to the endoplasmic reticulum, then that driver, the vesicle, will go and transport the item to the endoplasmic reticulum. So each item, each organelle, each protein that's made has a different cell uh, sequence, okay? So they have a different cell signal. And that tells them where to go, right? So what happens if a protein does not have a signal sequence? Well, if your protein does not have a signal, then it's just going to stay in the cytosol. So it's not going to stay, it's not going to go anywhere. So if a driver doesn't have a destination, like a taxi, well, it's not going to go anywhere, right? We don't have anything uh, to tell us where to go. And so I'm not going to waste my fuel, I'm not going to waste my gas, because that takes energy, and I'm not going to waste my energy. So here we have the ER and the cytosol. Here's a uh, protein within the ER, and here is the amino acid sequence that is specific for this ER protein. So once I transfer the signal sequence to the other protein, for instance, in this example, right, this protein, when it receives a signal, is going to go into, is going to go into the ER. So notice that this cytosol protein needed a signal sequence to enter the location that it needed to go to. And now we will be talking about the nucleus. So the nucleus is perhaps one of the most physically studied structure in the cell for undergraduates. And you probably already know that the nucleus is a double membrane bound organelle that has, uh, it's continuous with the ER membrane, that means it's connected to the ER membrane, and that it has some, some cool features. But what you may not have known is that the nucleus has nuclear pores, and these nuclear pores highlighted in like this nice uh, pink, these nuclear pores kind of act as doors for items, right? So for instance, a protein can actually enter, let's say protein X. So protein X can enter through one of these pores and it can go and it can exchange information or items with the nucleus. But now we have to uncover or discover how this happens and how this process of taking something in to the nucleus occurs. And again, this is called a gated, this is called a gated transport. And the protein is folded, so the protein is folded. But now we have to understand why this is called gated transport and how the protein is folded and how it enters the nucleus. So this is the nuclear pores. Notice that these nuclear pores, they kind of look like gates. So this nuclear pore is gated, okay? So we call it a gated transport because we have to enter this gate within the nuclear pore. And how does this occur? Well, it occurs, let's say that we have, again, protein X. But protein X has a carrier. So it has a little carrier, like a taxi, that drives it around, okay? And now eventually, protein X will come into contact with these little arms of the nuclear pore. And these arms are called cytosolic fibrils. Okay, so when it comes in contact with these cytosolic fibrils, what happens is that they will kind of pull apart the protein and the transporter. So again, this protein X is folded and it remains folded throughout the transport. So when I am transported through the uh, gated transport, or excuse me, when protein X is transported through the nuclear pores, I'm gonna change colors so you can see, it is still kinda associated with the protein transporter, 
except now this bond is going to be weaker. And eventually, they will be dissociated. So they will break apart. So now protein X and this transporter are going to be separated. So now I'm not connected. And now the protein X is going to be within the nucleus. So now this is in, in the nucleus. So I'll just call it nuke. So here in this nice picture, we have items, right? So here's the cytosol, and here's the nucleus. And here we have the nuclear pore complex. The nuclear pore complex is kind of like the collection within the cytosolic fibrils and the, um, the nuclear pores. So that's just kind of like the combination. So again, here is the pore complex, and they are a collection of proteins which we will later see, that allows protein X and its carrier to be disassociated. Here in this picture, we have a collection of nuclear pores. So all these gates are nuclear pores. And they kind of look like flowers if you look at it closely because they have this nice um, structure. I can't really describe it, but it looks magnificent really. Uh, if you've seen this in real life under a microscope, um, you would be really fascinated, as I was. Um, so we will actually see a picture of this uh, process occurring. And here is our protein. So let's call this protein X. And notice that protein X has transporter W, or signal W, for this example. Let's say that signal W tells it to go into the nucleus. So this protein has a nuclear localization signal which is W, and this is X. So when I need to enter the nucleus, I need to get a taxi. And so I'm gonna have a nuclear import receptor, and that's just gonna guide it. It's going to kinda of take in the protein and just guide it through the, um, the gate. So have you ever uh, sewn anything? Have you ever gotten a needle and thread, and you kinda of like lick the thread and try to put it into the needle, right? Well, that's kind of what you're doing. Your hand is focusing or is, is acting as the nuclear import receptor. And the thread is the protein. And the needle is the uh, gated, or, or uh, the uh, nuclear pore. So here is the kind of like the, the thread or um, the needle. Here is the thread. And then here is going to be your hand, which I can't really draw because I'm not good at, at drawing, right? So. You have this hand. I mean, have you ever seen other videos where like educators are magnificent drawers and they're artists or whatever? This more looks like more like a comb or whatever. But who cares? I'm a STEM major, or I was. I graduated. So here's your hand. Your hand is going to be focusing or acting as the nuclear import receptor. This is going to be the protein. Now your hand is going to be guiding the protein into the nuclear pore. This is the gated transport. So eventually, the protein will enter the needle and your hand is gonna be taken away from the protein. So that is all that is happening. Now, once the nuclear import receptor and the protein be are, are uh, combined, they're gonna be in contact with the cytosolic fibrils. So when they're in there, eventually they will dissociate. And here we have the protein still folded and we are in the nucleus. But how in the world do they come um, apart? So how, do, how does the uh, import receptor get away from the protein? We will actually figure out how that occurs. When the protein and the receptor enter the nuclear pore, they are bound to a substance, and this substance is called RAN-GTP. So you may remember this from ATP, but this is GTP. So instead of having adenine, Instead, we have guanine. So guanine is kind of like a specialized energy token. Now, when this happens, RAN-GTP is going to take out this protein and it's going to insert itself into the receptor. So the protein will continue its path into the nucleus, but instead, the RAN-GTP is going to take its place within the receptor. And now the GTP complex is going to go outside to the cytosol. But now, when we're outside of the cytosol, we have to get a protein, right? Because this taxi 
needs a protein. We're not having, we, we don't have a protein right here. We just have RAN GTP, which is kind of like some energy. So now RAN, which is kind of like the complex, RAN is going to, uh, is going to break one of the bonds. So here we have three phosphates attached to guanine. And this is attached to our uh, carrier. So let's draw this. So this is attached to our carrier, right? So this is RAN GTP. Eventually, we will have to break something. So this bond breaks, and when it breaks, it releases masses of mo uh, amount of energy. So here we have energy. And then we will have GDP. which is guanine diphosphate. So now this is ran GDP. And as a product, we also get PI and also some energy. So PI just means phosphoric acid, which is kind of like inorganic phosphate. That's, that's it. So this is always going to be the result. So this is inorganic, inorganic phosphate. Okay, so this is what you see for RAN GDP. So RAN GDP kind of disassociates with the um, with the receptor, right? So now we just have PPG floating around. And then since this receptor is empty, what happens here is that another protein that needs to go into the nucleus sees this empty receptor and is going to bind itself. So now we have this bound protein again, and this protein and receptor complex is going to enter the nucleus once again. And within the nucleus, RAN GTP, a new molecule, will enter and take, uh, it will replace the protein within the receptor. So this cycle continues, and this kind of allows the protein to enter the cell and for the receptor to exit the cell. Again, this is a cycle, and it will continue. But how do we do the process of taking the protein out and putting GTP into the receptor? And how do we hydrolyze the GTP? Hmm, good question. So now we're going to be zooming in even more to understand this process of exchanging the energy for the protein. And the way we do this is that we are going to be using RAN GAP. And we will also be using RAN GEF. So what do they do? Well, first of all, whenever the protein and the cargo, or I guess the uh, receptor, right? So let's draw this better. Whenever they do that, we have to exchange the protein for GTP, right? We have to get the protein out and then put GTP into the receptor, right? So the way we do that is that we are going to be using a kind of like a, um, it's a, it's a factor. Okay. So it's like a, a complex and RAN GEF is called guanine exchange, exchange factor. So this is the guy that kind of takes out the protein and puts a GTP into the receptor. So now here is RAN GTP. And this occurs because whenever the uh, protein is um, connected to RAN GEF, it shoots out the protein and it's going to put in a GTP inside the receptor. So now we have this complex where we have the receptor and the GTP. Again, protein X is just kind of in the nucleus. It, it goes away. I mean, that's all we needed. But now we have to find a way to get uh, the receptor and the GTP separated. So how do we do that? So now we're going to be using RAN GAP. So this is called GTP ACE activating protein. Activating, activating, activating protein. And it gives the signal, it allows the GTP to hydrolyze. And remember, hydrolyze means to break. And so whenever the GTP is close to the RAN GEAP or RAN gap, it will hydrolyze and it will become GDP. And when this occurs, it leaves the receptor 
it leaves this portion right there. And now we have GDP. And so now again, when this is empty, the protein X will enter the receptor. And so to recap, whenever the protein and the receptor go into the nucleus, they reach RAN GEF. RAN GEF will tell the protein to get out of the receptor and it will put a GTP into the protein receptor. Now the protein receptor and the GTP will go into the cytosol. Within the cytosol, it will come in contact with the RAN GAP. Now the RAN GAP will tell the GTP to hydrolyze and become GDP. Now when the GTP becomes GDP, it will come out and it will go into the cytosol. When the receptor is empty again, the protein will associate with itself within the receptor. Now again, the protein is still folded. So the protein is always, always folded. And whoever named these items, where it sounds GTP, GDP, GAP, GEF, like, really? Who does this? Like, this is ridiculous, you know? But it does make you sound smart, so, I don't know, whenever you're at a party, you can say some letters and sound like a PhD student or something, I don't know. But yeah, that is how the nuclear pore complex gated transport operates. And hopefully you understand that now. Now we will be talking about the transmembrane transport. So this is transmembrane transport. Specifically, this will be the mitochondria and also the chloroplast. So this is mitochondria and chloroplast. Now remember in the previous pictures, we mentioned that the mitochondria, the chloroplast, and the ribosomes are transmembrane transporters and that you can't really say, well, this protein is folded and this protein is unfolded because for different organelles, you have different folding states for the proteins. Now, specifically for the mitochondria and the chloroplast, the protein, the protein is going to be unfolded, is unfolded. It will be folded within the matrix. Now, what happens here is that the protein, which is unfolded, has a, a signal sequence. So the signal sequence is going to be red, and it's going to associate itself with some receptors. Now this receptor is called TOM, and it stands for the outer membrane, right? So that's what it means. Um, it means translocator in the outer membrane, so that's TOM. And what happens here is that the signal sequence is going to bind to the head of TOM, and this head will, transfer, uh, will transport the protein into the body of Tom. So when that happens, remember that we had a signal sequence right there and then we had a protein, right? Well, the head transfers the protein into the next part of the receptor. And now we kind of have a feeding mechanism where the protein will be fed into Tim. Now Tim is called translocator in the inner membrane. So we have the inner membrane of the mitochondria or chloroplast because again, we have a double membrane and the head of Tim will bind to the protein and eventually it will feed the uh, protein into the body of Tim. And now remember that Tim or the protein is always unfolded. And it kind of makes sense because if you had a folded protein that would take too much energy to unfold it. So I'd rather have a protein that is unfolded and it's going to be threaded into the receptors. So whenever the protein is uh, fed into Tim, it will eventually read, or uh, excuse me, it will eventually reach the matrix. So now we have our unfolded protein right there. Now, here some reactions are going to take place, and the protein will reach a folded configuration. And then sig uh, signal peptidiase, which is an enzyme, it's an enzyme, and this enzyme is going to cleave, it's going to cut. This enzyme cuts the signal, cuts the signal off. And so what happens here is that this protein has this signal, but then this enzyme is going to slice it apart. And so now you have the signal in the cytosol, or the matrix, excuse me, and then you have the protein by itself, and this protein is going to be folded right there, right? So again, signal peptidiase 
and really this uh, this should be a folded protein, but that's okay. Signal peptidase will cut this signal off, and the folded protein will actually be in the matrix. So here we have the mature mitochondrial protein. So to recap, the unfolded protein and the signal sequence will go into TIM, which stands for the uh, translocator in the outer membrane. Now, uh, Tom will go and it will transfer the unfolded protein into TIM, which stands for the transporter in the inner membrane. Now, when Tim receives the protein, it will shove it into the matrix. Now, signal peptidase, which is an enzyme, is going to cut the signal out of the protein, right? And the protein, which is now in a folded configuration, will remain in the matrix. And again, this is for the mitochondria and the chloroplasts, and this is classified as the transmembrane transport because we were uh, transferring, we transferred a protein between the membranes of one organelle. But you're probably wondering, well, you know, how are we going to cut these, uh, well not cut, how are we going to transfer these proteins between the membranes? You know, do we need energy to do that? Is it uh, passive? Is it active diffusion? What is it? Well, it's not passive diffusion, it's not active diffusion, but we do need energy. And I will show you how this process occurs. In order to guide the unfolded protein into the TOM complex, we will be using chaperones. And chaperones are kind of like proteins that guide the other protein. So we have chaperones, chaperones, and these are protein guides, protein guides. They help the protein stay intact because when I'm traveling, I don't want the protein to be breaking apart. No. And I also want the protein to stay unfolded. And so the chaperones are going to uh, make sure that the protein doesn't fall apart and that it stays unfolded. Now, when we reach the TOM complex, these chaperones need to come off. But before they do that, the chaperones guide the protein towards the head. And when they reach the head of the TOM complex, ATP is going to be used to take off the chaperones. So for every chaperone that we have, we will need one ATP to take it off. So since we have three chaperones in this example, we would need three ATPs. And eventually, whenever this unfolded protein reaches the TIM complex, we will have the mitochondrial chaperones. So now when this protein is growing, we will have the uh, mitochondrial chaperones attached to it, and those will guide it into the matrix. And now, in order for the chaperone to really bind to the, um, to the protein, we need to use another ATP. So first, the chaperone is kind of like just touching the protein, but we really, really need for the chaperone to do a conformational change and to really grab the protein. In order for that to happen, we use one ATP per chaperone. And, so, and, and, and really, so we need ATP. So to do transmembrane transport, we need ATP to do this. Um, and you'll see that later on for the ribosomes and for other organelles, but the main token of energy will have to be the ATP. Now this is a lot different from the nuclear, or I guess the gated transport, because gated transport, the energy that it used was GTP. So GTP is for the gated, G for G. Transmembrane uses ATP. And that is pretty important because well, people are often tested on which energy is used for which um, system. And now we will be talking about the peroxisomes. So these little blobs are peroxisomes. So these are peroxisomes, which I can't really spell. So let's do this better. So we have peroxisomes. And peroxisomes, uh, those are there so that the hydrogen peroxide, which is kind of like a byproduct of cell reactions, does not accumulate. The peroxisomes are there to remove the hydrogen peroxide because it's really toxic. And so these handle toxic waste. But how do the proteins enter the peroxisomes? Again, this is going to be transmembrane, transmembrane transport. And the protein, the protein is folded. 
So remember in the mitochondria and the chloroplasts, that was also transmembrane. However, those were unfolded. For the protein here in the peroxisomes, these are going to be folded. So you can see that there is a difference. So this is actually folded. This is not really a good picture because it looks like it's unfolded, but really it is folded. Now what happens here is that a short sequence of about three amino acids is going to be recognized by the peroxin receptor. So this blue guy right there is called a peroxin receptor. That is called a peroxin receptor. And the protein is going to attach itself to the peroxin receptor. And now this receptor brings the protein into the peroxisome. So here we have the receptor uh, going to be bound to it, right? So we're now bound. And again, we are folded. And so this peroxin protein receptor is going to bring it into the uh, peroxisome. So it kind of looks like a nuclear pore, right? That's what, that's what I thought when I was studying this. And so now this peroxin receptor will bind itself to this membrane. So here we have the peroxin receptors, and let's do this in a different color. So here we have the peroxin receptors. We have two heads, and they're bound to it. Eventually, the proteins will leave, and then we will have some empty peroxin receptors. So how do I get this peroxin receptors out? Well, first of all, I need to, I need to lace it with some ubiquitin. Ubiquitin means that whatever is tagged with ubiquitin will be destroyed or dislocated. So whenever we have ubiquitin on top of the peroxin receptor that is empty, it will tell it to dislocate from the membrane. So now we have the peroxin receptor just outside of the membrane. And then I will use ATP to kind of activate it again. So this is an inactive form of peroxin. I will use ATP to activate it again. And whenever I'm activated, I can then accept another protein. And this cycle continues. And so like the other transmembrane systems, we will be using the ATP. So to recap, the peroxin receptor will take in a folded protein. Then the complex will associate with the peroxisome membrane. When the proteins leave and they're still folded, they're still folded, the empty peroxisome receptors are going to be tagged with ubiquitin, which tells us to relocate or to dislocate. Now, this is an inactive form of the peroxin receptor. And so I would use ATP to activate the peroxin, peroxisome receptor again. And when this happens, I can accept another protein. And this cycle continues. We will now be talking about ribosomes. So within the cell, we have a stockpile of ribosomes, and these ribosomes are gonna be making proteins. Now, sometimes proteins are made within the cytoplasm, and then sometimes proteins are made within the ER. And so what tells the ribosome to make the protein in the cytosol or to make it in the ER? Well, that thing is called the ER signal sequence. So without the signal sequence, the ribosomes will just be floating inside the cytosol. And when this happens, the proteins that they make, because again, this is mRNA, the mRNA that is translated from the ribosomes is going to make a protein that stays within the cytosol. So protein, or I guess no uh, ER sig signal, will create a protein that stays, stays in the cytosol. However, if I receive an ER signal sequence, then this ribosome will bind to the ER membrane. And then it will continue to create proteins. And the proteins that it creates will be transcribed or translated into the empty space of the ER and the empty space is called the ER lumen. And so you can see that this protein is now being developed into the ER. And now we will zoom in even further to see this process occurring. And before I leave this slide, I have to show you that the mRNA is kind of like the data 
that the ribosome uses to create proteins. So this data is being read by the ribosomes and the protein that it makes is this guy. So without the signal, this protein will remain in the cytosol. But whenever I get an ER signal, the ribosomes will attach to the ER membrane and the data, which is the mRNA that is being read, will be created into this protein. So hopefully that uh, kind of clarifies what I just said because I realized that it may have been difficult to understand. Here we have the ribosome and this ribosome has the mRNA. So this is the five prime and this is gonna be the three prime. Now we need two things. We need the signal and we also need the signal recognition particle. So we call that the SRP. And the SRP kind of looks like a, um, a jelly bean, but it recognizes that this ribosome has a signal sequence. So when it sees the signal sequence, it will grab the ribosome and it will attach itself to this guy. And this is called a signal recognition particle receptor. So this is just the receptor that hugs the recognition particle. And when this happens, the signal recognition particle leaves. And now this signal uh, sequence, the red guy, is going to be associated to the protein translocator. So translocator just means a transferer. So now we are going to be transferring this protein through the ER membrane. And so again, we need two things. We need the signal sequence, and then we also need the signal recognition particle. And now this is a zoomed up image of what we just saw. Now remember that attached to this protein is the ribosome. And the ribosome still has the uh, five prime to the three prime. Okay, so that doesn't change. They just omitted that structure from this picture. And so here we are now attached to the protein translocator. Now next to the protein translocator is something called the signal peptidiase. And remember that the signal peptidiase is just an enzyme. And this enzyme is going to be breaking the signal off. So we're going to do a reaction and the signal peptidiase is going to cleave, is going to cleave this uh, signal sequence. Now when this happens, the signal sequence is left within the ER membrane and the protein is going to be disassociated and it's going to remain inside the ER lumen. And this is a folded, this is a folded, folded configuration. And so we can say that the proteins that are made are going to be soluble. So these are soluble, soluble proteins. Now, eventually we have to stop making proteins, right? And so instead of having a start signal, we also have a stop signal. So this is a start signal where we start uh, creating proteins within the membrane. And then we also have a stop signal. And this stop signal tells the ribosome to stop making proteins. So here again, we're going to feed the start signal into this protein translocator. Eventually, the stop signal is going to reach the protein translocator. So now over time, the protein translocator reaches the stop signal. So when it reads the stop signal, the signal peptidiase is going to cleave, it's going to cleave this area right there. So let's do that again. It's going to cleave this area. And whenever it cuts the signal off, the start signal is going to remain inside the ER membrane. However, the stop signal was not cut. And so the start, the stop signal remains inside the ER membrane. But notice something a bit weird. Remember, if you've taken biochemistry, and if you haven't taken biochemistry, um, I have lectures on it. In biochemistry, when proteins are made, they're made from the N terminus until the C terminus. So the N terminus is like the start and the C terminus is the stop or is the last section. And so whenever this uh, sequence is cut, 
the N terminus remains inside the lumen and the C terminus remains inside the cytosol. Cytosol. So here we have the C terminus and this is the lumen, right? So the N terminus remains in the lumen and the C terminus remains in the cytosol. So an easy way to remember this is that the C terminus is in the cytosol and the lumen has the N terminus. Now this is almost always the case for a simple protein. So a simple protein is just something that has one start terminus, or sorry, one stop sequence and one start sequence. So that's kind of like a simple protein. And whenever you have that, most likely the C terminus will be in the cytosol and the N terminus will be in the lumen. Now, sometimes a protein has different things. So for instance, here we have a nice structure where we have just one uh, stop sequence and one start sequence. But notice, just notice real carefully, that the start sequence is at the very tip of the protein. What happens if the stop sequence, or excuse me, what happens if the start sequence was in the middle? So ignore this first red. What happens if we have the start sequence inside the middle of the protein? What would we get? Well, we would get this weird structure. So notice that the start sequence is inside the middle of the protein. Whenever this start sequence is, trans uh, is uh, transferred to this protein translocator, it will create, it will create um, the protein. But notice what is missing. What we are missing is the signal peptidiase. So notice that there is no signal peptidiase. If there is no signal peptidiase, then there is no signal cleavage. There is no breaking of that signal. And so here we have no signal, no signal cleavage. And this is kind of like a special case for a double. This is a double, double pass double pass protein. And notice something else. The C terminus and the N terminus are inside the cytosol. Unfortunately, it is not always going to be like that. Depending on the position of the start sequence, you can either have the C terminus in the cytosol and the N terminus in the cytosol. Or you can possibly have the N terminus in the cytosol and the C terminus and the lumen. And so really, it's not a favorable thing, okay? So you can't really have an easy way to say, okay, this is how it's gonna look like. So it's not, it's not cool. Now for the other images, that was a single pass protein. For this one, this is a double pass protein. And for the double pass protein, the start sequence is gonna be in the middle, or it could be here, the only thing that it cannot do is be on the tip. That's bad. For the double pass, it could be anywhere on the protein except for the tip. And for the double pass membrane, or sorry, for the double pass protein, there is no signal peptidiase. And so we have no cutting of the signals. And now you're probably wondering, well, how do we even cut the signals? Because we're using signal peptidiase, but what kind of energy does that use? Does it use gasoline, solar radiation? I don't know, tacos or something, what, what does it use? Now we're gonna zoom in to this section. Here we have a picture of the ribosome carrying, carrying the protein, or I guess the data. And so this ribosome will become associated with the SRP receptor, okay? And whenever they become associated, GTP will be used and whenever we hydrolyze GTP we create GDP and the GTP will disassociate and then again the signal receptacle particle excuse me the signal re recognition particle sorry will again bind to the ribosome and so really this signal re uh, recognition particle it will carry the GTP. So this guy has GTP attached to it. 
So the signal recognition particle will bind to the ER sequence of the um, ribosome. And whenever it associates with the um, SRP receptor, it will hydrolyze the GTP. And so what I'm saying is, in order to create uh, proteins within the ER membrane, you will need to use the GTP. And so this is a transmembrane transport, transmembrane membrane transport. And whenever the protein is being created by this um, translocon, right, it is going to be folded within the ER lumen. And so we're, we're kind of, when we're being made, we are folding in the process. And so at first, the protein is unfolded. But then when it enters this blue channel, it becomes folded as, as it is being created. And so again, to recap, the signal recognition particle has the GTP. It binds to the mRNA, or excuse me, it binds to the ribosome. The SRP is going to be recognized by the SRP receptor. Now the GTP is going to be hydrolyzed into GDP. And then the cycle continues. And here, the protein within the transmembrane transport for the ER is going to be folded when it, when it is being created. And now we will be talking about vesicular, vesicular transport. Now within the vesicular transport, there are two pathways. There is the endocytosis and there is the exocytosis. So in the endocytosis uh, means that we are going to take something inside the cell. Vesicular transfer, by the way, is going to be transferring proteins and lipids, which is fats, between uh, cell organelles. So let's say that organelle W and organelle X are connected. Now W needs uh, lipids, and then X has lipids. And so X, are, there, um, the, the cell X is going to create little vesicles, little trucks, of lipids and it is going to do exocytosis. So in this pathway, the lipids would leave into the cytosol, or excuse me, into the extracellular space. And then these little lipids are going to get the signal and they're gonna enter cell W. And now that is going to go to the endocytosis pathway. And so in this pathway, the lipids are going to enter the cell. And so vesicular transport allows us to transfer proteins and lipids between cells. Now, here in the endocytotic pathway, we are really gonna be uh, dealing with the endosome. Now, the endosome is kinda like the post office, okay? So here, it is going to take things coming into the cell, and it's gonna say, okay, where do you wanna go? I got this letter from this person, and it turns out that this uh, this letter needs to go to the lysosome, or this letter needs to go to the ER, or this letter needs to go to the Golgi apparatus. So really, the endosome, the endosome, is going to be acting as a signal, as a signal, or I guess, um, well, yeah, I guess like a signal uh, house, right? So what I'm saying is that the endosome is going to take items coming into the cell and is gonna tell it where to go inside the cell. So this lipid came inside, inside the cell, well this lipid is gonna to go to the endosome, and the endosome is gonna tell this lipid to go to the Golgi, go to the endoplasmic reticulum, go into a vesicle, or it could go to a lysosome. However, in the exocytosis, we don't use the endosome. Instead, instead we are going to be using the Golgi apparatus. And so here, Whenever something needs to leave the cell, let's say a lipid, the lipid is gonna be inside the Golgi apparatus. And the Golgi apparatus is gonna modify the lipid and it's gonna attach a signal sequence. And this signal sequence will tell it to go to different parts of the cell. So this signal sequence can say, okay, you need to go to the endosome. 
and when it reaches the endosome, it will go to the lysosome. Or it may say, okay, you need to go to this cell, or you need to go outside. And so what I'm saying is, the endosome is going to be for the endocytosis, and the Golgi apparatus is for the exocytosis. Therefore, whenever we're dealing with the secretory pathway, the pink one, we go from the ER to the Golgi, and we go from the Golgi to the plasma membrane. Or we can go from the ER to the Golgi, and then Golgi to the endosome, and then from the endosome to the lysosome. Now, for the endocytotic pathway, most of the time, you're going to go from the plasma membrane to the lysosome. And that's kind of like the majority of the time. But how do we create vesicles? So let's say that this is the inner cell. So this is the inner cell. And right here in the inner cell, we need to move insulin out, right? So I need to move insulin out. How do I do that? So let's write insulin. Well, how do we move insulin out? Well, as you can see, this vesicle is starting to form. And the way that we make vesicles is that we are going to be using clathrin. So clathrin will be used to create basket-like cages within the vesicle, okay? So the clathrin will shape the membranes into vesicles. Clathrin shapes, shapes membranes into vesicles. Let's see, vesicles. And if you are curious, it kind of looks like, um, just kind of like 3D spheres. It, it kind of looks like cereal, uh, honeycombs, if you ever had that cereal. And what happens is that these little black dots that you see within these uh, vesicle, that's the clathrin molecule. So we have these little black dots. And these little black dots are going to associate with each other and they're going to make like a net structure and that net structure will sh help shape the membranes into vesicles and within this vesicle and in in, in in this example is the insulin so if the body needs insulin the insulin will aggregate or collect onto the plasma membrane and eventually it reaches a point where the clathrins will pinch off this membrane and create a vesicle and so now we're going to see how this process occurs. Continuing our example of insulin, the red dots are going to be called insulin because it's a really good example, insulin. Now, whenever the body needs insulin, the insulin will bind to the plasma membrane and it will form uh, a collection of insulin particles. Eventually, the insulin is going to reach a cargo receptor. So it is just a receptor, kind of like a fork, that just recognizes that there is a collection of particles building up. So whenever these collections of particles build up, it is going to reach the cargo receptor. Now on the other side of the cytosol, there are things called clathrins, which I've already talked about. Now these clathrins are attached to the plasma membrane by anchors. And these anchors are called adaptins. And you can see right there, these are called adaptins. Okay? These are adaptins. Now, eventually, whenever so many uh, insulin particles, or really any particles, are uh, aggregate, aggregated on the plasma membrane, they form a sphere. Now, this sphere is created and maintained by the clathrin. So notice that the clathrin have kind of like a curvy shape. And this curvy shape is used to create a spherical structure. Without the clathrin, it would just kind of be a, a weird blob. But the clathrin helps smooth it out. So now we get this nice pinched structure. But now how do we get rid of this stem? Well, the way that we get rid of the stem, because we need to cut it off, is that we are going to be using a complex called dynamin. And dynamin wraps around this loose stem and it wraps super tightly, so tightly in fact, that it pinches it off and cuts it. 
And whenever it cuts the stem, we now have a vesicle. We, we now have a vesicle. And so now this vesicle is within the cytosol and it can actually transfer its cargo, the cargo being insulin. Now, whenever we are done forming the vesicle, the clathrins and the adaptins disassociate from the vesicle. So here we have the naked transport vesicle and it can go to a different um, structure and it can even release its cargo within the cytosol, right? So that is how you form a vesicle. And before I forget to mention, the way that Dynamin operates is that it will hydrolyze GTP. So it uses GTP, the energy from GTP, to cut the stem from the vesicle. So again, for this vesicle formation, we use GTP. Whenever we want to get the vesicle back into a, a plasma membrane, let's say that this is a different cell, we need to do some more reactions. So here we have our insulin. So this is going to be our insulin. Again, and let's kind of rewrite this. So this cargo protein is insulin. Now within the vesicle that formed, we have a receptor and we also have a V-snare. Now it's pretty easy to remember what a V-snare is because scientists labeled it as this. So snare means trap. So we're going to trap this vesicle onto the plasma membrane. The V in V-snare stands for vesicle. So this is a vesicle. Therefore, the V-snare is going to be found on the vesicle. And here we have the T-snare. And the T-snare, the T-snare is going to be called tethering. And tethering means attachment. So whenever I tether something, it means that I attach something. I'm going to connect them. Okay. So here, what happens is that we have a tethering protein. Now the tethering protein is going to attach itself to another protein. And this is called the RAB. So the RAB protein is on top of the vesicle. It, it, um, it's always going to be attached to the vesicle. And the RAB protein is going to connect with the tethering protein. So the tethering protein is acting like an arm. So it grabs the vesicle and is going to gently place it on top of the membrane. So whenever it gently places the vesicle on top of the membrane, the T snare and the V snare connect. And whenever they connect, they start coiling, they start twisting. And they twist so much that eventually this opens up, the vesicle opens up, and it releases the cargo into the cell. So now we have the insulin and it is delivered. And so to recap, on top of the vesicle is the RAB protein. And the vesicle has the V snare, which stands for vesicle snare or vesicle trap. Eventually, the vesicle reaches the tethering protein. Now the tethering protein attaches to the RAB and it gently places the vesicle on top of the cell membrane. Now when this happens, the T snare, which means to tether, tethering trap, that is going to attach to the V snare and they're going to twist and whenever they twist, they open up the vesicle. And so now again, we have the receptor and if insulin were to build up again, the insulin would eventually reach the receptor and start the cycle all over again. And here we have the docking phase and the membrane phase. So the docking phase is whenever the cargo and whatever needs to be transferred is going to be attached to the cell membrane. So here the vesicle attaches to the uh, cell membrane and the V-snare and the T-snare are going to connect. And whenever they connect, you see them twisting. And whenever they twist, we enter the membrane fusion, when the membrane begins to open up and connect to this new membrane. And so now, 
my proteins, or uh, excuse me, my insulin is going to enter the cell. So here we keep uh, transferring some cool stuff, right? So I think that's pretty cool of how uh, vesicles operate and how they um, exchange um, items. Now, many proteins are modified within the ER. So this is going to be the ER. And some modifications within the ER is um, disulfide bond formation. So disulfide bond occurs whenever the, um, how should I say, whenever the sulfur binds to another sulfur of a cysteine molecule, right? So cysteine is, again, a uh, amino acid. So that is a disulfide bond. And that really occurs within the ER membrane, right? But sometimes, um, and this, by the way, is for protein stabilization. But sometimes we also do uh, sugar additions. And so within the ER, we do glycosylation. Glycosylation. So let's do glyco, glycosylation. And that is the addition of a sugar side chain. So why do we do that? Well, we do that because it offers protein stabilization. And it offers protection for the protein. I don't want this protein to go into, in, into the ER lumen without a sugar. Because if it goes into the ER lumen, it could be degraded. So that is a protein. But without the sugar, it might break apart. And so all this work that I did is for nothing. So I don't want that to happen. Therefore, I do glycosylation. So I add this sugar group, and it's going to protect the protein. Now, this sugar group also helps the protein to undergo proper folding. So without the sugar, this folding does not exist, right? So this folding, here's without the sugar, and here's with the, with the sugar. So notice that without the sugar, I'm not folded, but with the sugar, I am folded. We also add sugars so that we do cell-to-cell -cell recognition, like blood cells. Blood cells have sugar groups on their exterior so that they know that they belong in the system, right? That they're not some sort of foreign uh, item. And then sugars also act as signals. So sugars create signals. Now, how do we do this? How do we add a sugar to the protein? Well, we add a sugar to the protein by using an enzyme called oligosaccharyl transferase. So this enzyme is going to transfer is going to transfer it a preformed sugar onto the growing peptide or to the growing protein. Now, where does it attach it? Well, it attaches it into the asparginin. Okay, so we're really going to attach it to the asparginin, right? So asparagin is the attachment point, is the attachment, attachment, attachment point. But here are some sequences that it could attach to. So it can attach to the asparginin, to some other amino acid, and then to serine or it can attach it to the asparg asparagine, some other amino acid, it doesn't really matter, it could be anything, or to threonine. And so if the protein has a sequence of asparagine, some other protein, and then serine, the oligosaccharyl transferase will read it, and it will attach the sugar into the asparagine. So now the sugar is going to be attached to the asparagine, it will cleave Oh, well, signal peptidase will cleave the protein, and the protein will have a sugar group attached to it. So here's some sugar group right there. Now, between serine and threonine, that's okay. It could be anything, right? It could be serine or it could be threonine. Now, the X's could be any amino acid. So the main thing that you have to remember is that asparagine is always used for oligosaccharyl transferase, and we can also use serine or threonine. And this illegal sacral is actually attached to the membrane via a lipid link. And so it's going to be attached to the membrane uh, using this uh, lipid as an anchor. 
and this illegal saccharide is going to be further modified within the ER and the Golgi apparatus. So if this protein were to go into, in, into the uh, Golgi apparatus, the Golgi apparatus would modify the protein and also modify the sugar group. So it may take it off or it may add more sugars to this depending on what needs to be done. Not every protein that is made within the ER gets to leave. So some proteins cannot leave the ER. So why are some proteins held? Why can't they leave? Well, sometimes the protein uh, has a signal that is called a retention signal. So, it, so we don't leave the protein. We don't leave, don't leave the ER if we have a signal retention, right? So we have signal retention sequence. And that's kind of like four amino acids, right? So that's four amino acids with a C terminus. And so if the ER membrane or the ER um, reads the four amino acid sequence and it says, okay, well, you know, this is a signal, uh, this is a signal retention sequence. I can't make the protein leave because its protein is not ready. It has a sequ uh, the signal sequence, therefore it's not ready. So if we have a signal retention sequence, then the ER will not leave, uh, will not let the protein leave. Okay. Sometimes the protein, sometimes the protein is incorrectly folded. Protein is incorrectly, incorrectly folded. And so if the ER sees that the protein is incorrectly folded, then it's going to withhold the protein. It's going to make it stay even longer. And then sometimes the proteins are assembled into something called a multimeric. So this is called a multimeric, multimeric protein. If the protein is folded into a multimeric protein, then it's not going to be, it's not going to leave, okay? So a multimeric protein is essentially a protein that has a bunch of chaperones. So this is called a retention, retention by chaperones. And so when the protein is folded into a multimeric protein, that means that it will be retained by the chaperones. And whenever it is uh, retained by the chaperones, it will not be able to leave the ER. So this is why we don't leave the ER sometimes. Sometimes the protein has a signal retention sequence. Sometimes it is incorrectly folded. And sometimes it is folded into a multimeric protein in which it is held by chaperones. When all these things happen, it could be a combination or it could just be one thing, the protein cannot leave the ER. Within the ER, we have sensors that sense for the misfolded proteins. So if a protein is attached to any one of these sensors, the ER will signal to uh, a, a specific uh, protein, and this protein will inhibit the creation of more proteins. Okay, so this is the inhibitor of protein synthesis. Because if the misfolded protein is present, then clearly we don't want to create more proteins, right? It's kind of like a factory. If you're making something like food, and you see a defective product, then a worker will signal for the conveyor belts and the machines to stop operating because we got to focus on this one product so that it's perfect. So whenever the ER senses that a misfolded protein is present, it will stop protein synthesis. And then it will activate other pathways to create uh, signals that activate the chaperones. And these chaperones are going to go and they're going to bind to the uh, misfolded protein and they're going to try to fold it back into a good place. Okay, so the activation of chaperone genes, plus some other genes, they're going to increase the protein folding capacity within the ER. So again, we have some sensors. They see that there are some misfolded proteins present. They're going to stop the, uh, the creation of protein. They're going to stop it. And then, then they're, they're going to get their chaperones, and their chaperones are going to help bind to the misfolded protein. We will now be talking about the Golgi apparatus. So within the Golgi apparatus, we have two networks. We have the cis network, and then we have the trans network. So what's the difference between cis network and the trans network? 
Well, the cis network faces the ER. It faces the ER. And the trans network faces the plasma membrane. Plasma membrane. So within this structure, if you were given this on an exam, the ER membrane would be here, and the plasma membrane would be here. And so the cis Golgi would be on the top, and the trans Golgi would be on the bottom. And here is some pita bread to show the uh, structure of the Golgi apparatus. This would be the cis structure, which is the top, and this would be the trans structure, which is at the bottom. So the cis structure is mainly for um, endocytosis, and the trans structure is mainly for exocytosis. Here we have exocytosis. Exo, exocytosis. So, exocytosis. Later we will be talking about the endocytosis. But for the exocytosis, we, are be, we will be using uh, the Golgi apparatus as an example. Here, this is the cis portion, and here is the trans portion. So notice that the trans portion, let's write that better, the trans portion is going to be facing towards the plasma membrane. Now we will have two uh, pathways. We have the constitutive secretion, and then we also have the regulated secretion. So we have the um, constitutive, and then for this portion we have the regulated, regulated secretion. So constitutive means that there is no signal involved. So there is no signal, no signal involved. And this is a continuous, continuous, continuous um, operation. So let's look at it. So here, let's say that we have insulin, right? Well, not insulin. That's a, that's a bad example for this one. Uh, let's just say that we have molecule I don't know, uh, D, right? And so molecule D needs to be excreted outside of the cell constantly. Like, let's say that it's a waste product. And so what happens here is that we form vesicles. And these vesicles don't need a signal, okay? Because if it needs a signal every time it needs to release waste, it's going to be really um, inefficient. And so this can uh, be continuing without signals, right? So here's the waste and it is always going to be releasing it. So this is the unregulated exocytosis, okay? So for this example, they said proteins, it could be waste, it could be really anything, right? Because that's more of a continuous operation. Now for the regulated secretion, the regulated is only, only in some cells. So not all cells do regulated secretion. Here, the products the products kind of aggregate. So what I mean by aggregate, that they are going to collect on top of the plasma membrane, okay? And they are stored within secretory, secretory vesicles until a signal is received, until a signal is received, okay? So here we have the trans Golgi network. So this is trans Golgi network. We have the insulin being placed into the vesicle. The vesicle will go into the plasma membrane. Now we have a signal. The signal tells us to release the insulin and it goes outside into the cytosol. And here is an example of the regulated exocytosis. So we have the secretary, uh, secretory vesicle containing insulin and it is going to be aggregated, it's going to be aggregated onto the plasma membrane. And whenever this happens, the signal is received and we shoot out the insulin. So now the insulin is going to be inside the uh, cytosol or the extracellular space. Now we will be talking about endocytosis. So this is endo, endocytosis. Endocytosis means that we are going to be taking something from the outside and bringing it into the cell. Here we have the process of phagocytosis. So this is phagocytosis. And that is the process of taking up particles into the large 
uh, vesicles, specifically taking something into the phagosomes. So this is the phagosomes, and you really see this uh, occur in immunology, where everything is phagocytic, so it's going to be eating, because uh, phago means to eat, right? So this is eat, so this is eating, eat organelles, right? So here we have uh, bacterium and the plasma membrane. These are the pseudopods. Pseudopods are kind of like the false feet that is moving around. So notice that this bacterium went into the wrong neighborhood. He's trying to infect the host cell, but the host cell has the uh, has phag uh, phagocytic white blood cells because our bodies have white blood cells. And what our white blood cells do is that they use their pseudopods to kind of wrap around the bacterium. And when they wrap around the bacterium, they ingest, they eat it, they eat the bacterium. And so whenever they eat the bacterium, that is called endocytosis. And the white blood cell is acting as a phagosome. So here we can see that the white blood cell is kind of taking in this uh, bacterium and is going to eat it for breakfast. Very disgusting. Instead of talking about solid material, where we were talking about bacterium and phagocytosis, Another aspect of endocytosis is called pino. It's called pinocytosis. And what pinocytosis does is that it is the uptake, it is the uptake of fluids and other molecules within small vesicles. So that occurs within clathrin, clathrin uh, coated pits, so coated uh, vesicles. Right? And is balanced, it is balanced with the rate of exocytosis, balanced with exocytosis. Because if you just had more endocytosis than exocytosis, then the cell would run out of space. And so we need to be in equilibrium with the exiting of material. So here we have minerals, let's say ions, or whatever, um, vitamins, biotin, whatever eventually they're going to be absorbed into the uh, vesicle via pinocytosis. And so we need fluid to survive. And so this pinocytotic vesicle will have minerals and vitamins and ions and water, and that's going to insert itself into the uh, cell. So you can see here on this picture, this is actually a pinocytotic vesicle, and it's forming, right? So we have these little forming vesicles right there that look like balloons these vesicles are forming and they're going to line a small uh, blood vesicle sorry blood vessel and so this blood vessel needs uh, nutrients right so it's going to get nutrients from the outside world and here we have the endocytosis specifically pinocytosis what if we have receptor mediated endocytosis how would that work so receptor mediated endocytosis endocytosis is kind of like what you saw for exocytosis but it's in the opposite direction so let's say that this is again uh, some low density lipids okay so for this example they're using lipids or fats so cells need fats to survive let's say that we're running out of fats here the vesicles are arriving from the cytoplasm now they're gonna start forming on the plasma membrane now when the vesicles attach to the plasma membrane, they're going to attach to the LDL receptors. When the vesicles attach to the LDL receptors, they form another clathrin, or I guess they form another vesicle. So now we are ingesting, we are doing endocytosis of these vesicles with fats in them. So now whenever these vesicles are within the, um, the cytoplasm right, of the cell, they are going to go into the endosome. So first, the LDL vesicles were in the extracellular space. Now they're going to be entering the plasma membrane, and then they're going to be inside the cytosol. Now, right here, we have a fusion. We have a fusion of the vesicle with the endosome. Now the endosome is kind of like the post office. It tells the item, for instance, the LDL, where to go. So either the LDL will go into the extracellular space or the endosome will tell it to go to a different part. 
So for instance, let's say that the LDL needs to go to the lysosome. So the endosome is gonna modify this vesicle with the fats and it's gonna insert a signal tag and the signal tag will tell it to go to the lysosome. Now the lysosome has a very low pH because it has a lot of protons in it. Now whenever the uh, vesicle with the LDL, the fats, have to go to the lysosome, the lysosome is going to break the fats apart. And when this happens, it's going to release free cholesterol. And the free cholesterol can be used for the cell to make plasma membranes or other um, cell compartments or components. And so to recap, whenever the vesicles uh, connect or collect on this uh, plasma membrane, they're going to activate the receptors and then a vesicle will form. This vesicle will go into the endosome always the endosome because endocytosis, endosome. It will go into the endosome and it will tell the uh, vesicle where to go. So in this example, it tells it to go to the lysosome. The lysosome breaks apart the, the fats and the fats become free cholesterol. And now the receptor that was taken up, right here, you see the receptor, the receptor will be uh, spat out back into the extracellular space. And so the endosome tells the receptor to go out back onto the plasma membrane. And so that is receptor-mediated endocytosis. Within the, endo, uh, within the endosome, there are three functions. There is the recycling function, there is the degradation function, and there is the transcytosis function. Now the recycling function is what you saw in the previous photo, where we had the receptors like this, inside the vesicle. And whenever it goes into the endosome, the receptor is allowed to go back into the uh, plasma membrane. And so the blue receptors in the previous photo, that was recycled. In the previous photo, you also saw that we had the lipids. And these lipids were going to be degraded in the lysosome. So the endosome tells the lipids to go into a vesicle, and this vesicle will be transported into the lysosome. So here the vesicles would go to the lysosome and they would break the, uh, the lipids. So now we have free cholesterol, and that was a degradation process. And sometimes, sometimes the cell doesn't even need the items that was transported. And so the endosome says, okay, I got some lipids over here, I don't really need them. The cell's pretty good right now. I'm just going to pass it on to someone else. And so now the vesicles, the vesicles, they're going to transfer the lipids and they're going to go back into the plasma membrane and to a different cell. So this endosome has the ability to transfer unused items to different cells. So within the endosome, we have three functions. Okay? Within the endosome, we have the recycling function, where the receptors go back to the plasma membrane. We have the degradation function, in which the cargo goes into the lysosome and is breaking down for parts. And we also have this transcytosis function, in which unused cargo or items can be transferred to different cells for other uses. Here we have the lysosome. And the lysosome is the site for intracellular digestion. So the lysosome digests extracellular materials and other old organelles. It is very acidic. It is so acidic that it has a pH of 5 when the other parts of the cell have a pH of 7.2. So this, uh, the pH of 7.2 is pretty normal. But the pH of 5 is very acidic. In fact, it's about, like, a, I say, 100 times more acidic inside the lysosome than the outside. Now, how can that happen? Well, it does it by having a high concentration of uh, protons. So we have a high concentration of hydrogens. Okay. So how do I get that high concentration of hydrogens? Well, I get it by having a hydrogen pump. So this is an active pump. And when it is active, it is going to be using the energy of ATP to drive the concentration 
of hydrogen within the lysosome very, very uh, up. Okay, so the concentration of, of protons within the lysosome is incredibly high because we're using the energy from ATP to power this hydrogen pump. Now, the lysosome also has transporters that export metabolites. So metabolites are kind of like nutrients and other, um, other items. So for instance, whenever we were degrading the lipids, we were making cholesterol, correct? We were making free cholesterol. So now I gotta get this cholesterol out of here. So the way I do this is that I'm going to transfer the cholesterol through the metabolite transporter. So now the, the cholesterol is going to be exiting outside of the lysosome. So sometimes the membrane proteins that enter the lysosome, they don't wanna be degraded. Because look, if I'm putting my vesicles inside the lysosome, do I want my vesicles to get degraded? No, I don't want to do that. I want to protect my carriers because I just want to degrade whatever the, the vesicles are, are carrying. I don't want to destroy my vesicle itself. And so what I do is that I'm going to get my vesicles and I'm going to uh, do glycosylation. So these proteins that make up the vesicles are glycosylated. So the proteins that do transfer, so transfer proteins, proteins of vesicles are glycosylated. They are glycosylated for protection. Okay. Now, what is the specific signal that tells us to go into the lysosome? Well, the specific signal would have to be the mannose. It will be the mannose 6 phosphate. So the, the mannose 6-phosphate, whenever it is read by the endosome, it says, okay, well, I see that you have the mannose 6-phosphate tag. That means I'm going to send you to the lysosome. Okay. Now, where did that mannose 6-phosphate occur? Where, where did that come from? Well, it came from the trans, the trans Golgi network. Golgi network. And so, let's see here. We have cell uh, W and then we have cell X. Cell W transferred lipids, okay? So it says, okay, I, I see that my neighbor X needs lipids, so I'm gonna transfer some lipids. But before it transferred lipids, the lipids had to go through the trans-Golgi network. And within the trans-Golgi network, the Golgi said, okay, since I need to give lipids to my neighbor protein uh, cell X, I need to put the mannose 6-phosphate tag on these lipids. So whenever my neighbor gets these lipids, the endosome will read the tag and it's going to send it to the, um, to the lysosome for nutrients. And so I have to make sure that I add the mannose 6-phosphate tag onto these lipids. And so now we have the tag. So we have the little tag on it. And now these lipids enter the cell X with the tag. So now when the endosome from cell X reads the lipids, it reads the mannose 6-phosphate tag that was inserted via the trans-Golgi network on inside cell W. So now it reads and it says, oh, okay, I, I need to send this to the lysosome for nutrients. And so that is kind of like how the whole process of sharing nutrients occurs. Finally, we have kind of like the, the endocytosis going into the lysosome. Sometimes organelles get old. Like for instance, this mitochondria is getting old. And so now we will do kind of like an enclosure. We will wrap this old organelle with a double membrane. So this is a double membrane, double membrane. And what happens here is that this double membrane will transfer the old organelle. This is an old organelle. And it will create an autophagosome. And so now you can see that the cell is eating itself. Auto means self. Phagosome or phago means eat. So self eat. So this only occurs to old organelles. So when the old mitochondria cannot can no longer function it will receive a signal to wrap around 
the old organelle. And now the signal will tell it to go to the lysosome for degradation. And here we have the old organelle and it can be recycled. It can be recycled for new parts, which is kind of disturbing, but it's really cool. And so that is the pathway for lysosomes. And, oh, and now that is the, the end of the lecture. So hopefully you understand how the membranes are, are formed or how they transfer vesicles, how vesicles are formed, how uh, gated pathways occur, transmembrane pathways occur, vesicle pathways, etc. Um, it was a lot of material, but hopefully you understand it. And if you didn't, you can watch the video all over again and hear my, my magnificent voice. So thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that you understand uh, understood everything that I said. And remember that you are amazing and that I love you. So thank you so much for watching and have a great day. Thank you.